So good afternoon, everybody. There's a couple of things I wanted to talk about around mobile. I think the first and really the most important is the sense that mobile is really making technology a universal product. That is to say, we sold mainframes to big companies, and we sold PCs to middle class families, and we sold technology in one way or another to a segment or a portion or a subset of the population. But mobile is a product that gets sold to pretty much everybody on Earth. And that's really the first time the technology has been, industry has been doing that, and that's a fundamental change. And so if you look at the growth that we had going into the bubble back in 2000 when we were all young and optimistic and thought the future was bright, we went from about 40 million people online to around 400 million people online. But since then, we've gone to about 3 billion people online and 2 billion people with smartphones. And in the next few years, we'll add another billion, and all of that growth will be driven by smartphones. So effectively, the smartphone will be the universal product. One of the ways to think about that is with a chart that goes not up and to the right, like all tech industry charts, but actually down and to the right. Because what this chart shows you is the end of the unconnected. That is to say, we are getting towards the point where the number of people who do not have a connection, um, the people who are not online, starts to approach zero. And so this shows the proportion of the adult population globally that first doesn't have the internet and then doesn't have a smartphone. And you can see both of those numbers trending quite fast towards zero. That means that by 2020, of about 7 billion people on Earth and a bit over 5 billion adults, over 4 billion will have a mobile phone. And almost all of those will have converted to a smartphone. And as you can see, that's really where all the growth is going to come from. And that dwarfs the size of the PC install base, never mind the consumer PC install base, which is probably about half that. So you get to a point where we have 4 billion smartphones and maybe 1.5 billion PCs and perhaps 6 or 700 million consumer PCs. It's worth taking a step back as well and talking about, thinking about what we mean when we say a smartphone. Because the CPU in a new iPhone, an iPhone 6, has over 600 times more transistors than a Pentium from back in 1995 when Intel went consumer in a big way. And so if you count up all the phones that Apple sold at the launch weekend for the iPhone 6, you get about 25 times more CPU transistors than were in all the PCs on Earth in 1995. So in raw crude terms, 25 times more raw computing power than were in every PC on Earth combined, just from the phones sold in one weekend. And so that means everybody gets a pocket supercomputer. And yes, we do mean everybody. So even in sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of the population today is under cellular coverage. Not all of that is 3G yet, but it will be 3G soon, and even 4G. And that's more than have access to improved water, more than have access to grid electricity, Already about 40% of the population has a mobile phone. Um, not a smartphone yet, but that's converting quite quickly to smartphones. And of course, the thing that drives that is cheap Android. And so the average price of a PC today is about $600. The average price of an iPhone is slightly higher. Apple is in the curious position of increasing its market share by selling a more expensive, higher margin product, which is a good problem to have. The average price of an Android device, on the other hand, is currently about $250. And the entry price for Android today is only $30 or $40. Now, that doesn't so much get you a VW experience as a motorcycle rickshaw experience, but it gets you there, and it gives you a, a kind of a credible experience of a smartphone with a touch screen and internet access. And in fact, at this point, the interesting question becomes, what are you paying for connectivity, and what do you have to pay to charge your phone? Because yes, you have to pay somebody to let you charge your phone if you're that kind of customer. And so there's a big gray area. But fundamentally, um, mobile means that computing becomes this universal platform. That means that we go from rich people like this having phones, and yes, every single person in that image is rich by global standards, to people like this man, um, in Transkai in rural South Africa, adopting the universal human position of go away, I'm looking at my phone. <laughs> and as you can see, this guy does not have grid electricity. He does not have pipe water in his home, but he has a mobile phone and quite possibly a smartphone. Smartphone penetration in South Africa is close to 50% today. And so mobile remakes the tech industry, simply because mobile is so much bigger as an ecosystem than the PC industry was. So there are about 4 billion people on Earth buying a phone every two years on average, as opposed to about 1.5 billion PCs being replaced every five years. So the phone business is bigger, and it's, getting it's converting from feature phones to smartphones, and so smartphones are much bigger. And so this chart shows you um, quarterly unit sales of PCs, which look like a hot growth business. Um, at least it looked like that to Steve Ballmer. 
and then you get laid against that, you see unit cells of iOS and Android devices, and you can see very clearly a shift in scale. Indeed, it seems quite likely that phones have a scale that's unique in the technology industry. If you compare mobile phones and smartphones to things like games consoles or cameras or TVs or even PCs, you can see there's a fundamental difference. And in fact, if you want to find a manufactured product that has the same kind of scale as mobile phones, you really need to look at things like shoes or toothbrushes. There's no other um, kind of sophisticated manufactured product, certainly no other electronic product that has anything like that kind of scale. And going back to that guy in Transkai, you are starting to see people at the margins of the mobile industry now for whom a mobile phone is the first electrical device they've ever owned. Not the first electronic device, the first electrical device that they've ever owned. That means that mobile is eating the consumer electronics industry. So smartphones and tablets are now close to half of the entire revenue of the global consumer electronics industry. It also means that Microsoft is no longer the dominant force in technology. This chart shows you Microsoft's share of sales of, of computing devices. So PCs, smartphones, games consoles, tablets. And of course, back in, 1999, in 2009, when we were still really only talking about PCs, Microsoft dominated because they dominated the PC industry. But now that PCs are only a, um, a minority platform, you can see that Microsoft's share of connected devices has gone down from 80 or 90% to have perhaps 50 to 20% of the devices being sold. And that's not because PCs have gone away, it's because mobile is so much bigger. The other change in scale, of course, is that the US is no longer the biggest market. So here you see in orange Chinese mobile internet users laid against the population of the USA in the dotted line and the population of Europe and the UK um, in the solid line up above. China's quite a big place and they're all getting smartphones and they're all going online with those smartphones and using that smartphone as their first and primary internet device. Um, and so you see a great deal of innovation coming out of that market as a result. Indeed, if you then ask Chinese teenagers what brand they want, First, they say they want an iPhone. Then they say they want a phone from brand, interesting new brands like Xiaomi or Meizu. Um, and Samsung is a hand-me-down phone they get from their grandmother. They all have Samsungs, but that's not the phone they want to have. Um, and the interesting thing about companies like Xiaomi or Meizu is not just that they're building a market. It's that they found ways to provide a differentiated software experience and a, and a differentiated route to market that the old line phone makers and the old line PC makers never managed. And so you're not just seeing cloning. You're seeing really in interesting and innovative new business models coming out of that market and changing how people think about what it means to be a handset maker or an Android handset maker. All of this means that the tech center of gravity has moved. It used to be that you would go to Seattle, or you would go to Tokyo, or you would go to Ispu in Finland to find out the future of technology. And so you'd ask Microsoft, or Intel, or Nokia, or NTT Docomo in Japan. Today, it's all about the San Francisco Bay Area. It's about Apple and Google, because everything has shifted back to software. And then in chips, it's not Intel, it's ARM and Qualcomm. And then, of course, in mobile, it's about China again and San Francisco. So the center of gravity has moved away from those old locations to new locations. Finally, the mobile supply chain dominates much more than just mobile. It's not just about replacing PCs with mobile phones. There's a much broader impact because there is a flood of smartphone components coming out of that industry that are available off the shelf to anybody else. All the components are commoditized. All of them are available off a price list. So it's effectively as though the mobile industry has dumped a shipping container worth of Lego onto the table, and everyone is picking it up and wondering what they can do with it. These components are Lego for technology. In parallel, all of those phones are made by contract manufacturers, and so they can assemble those components into anything else for you as well. And that can be a connected door lock. It could be a drone. It could be aug augmented reality. And so those two factors combine are what powers all these other smart devices. It powers wearables and Internet of Things and connected cars and drones and everything else. Because fundamentally, all of those things are basically smartphones just put together in a different way, but put together by the same people with the same components. And that means that the hardware technology is available on the sh or more or less off the shelf for anything that you might want. Um, in the past, if you had a vision for an amazing product, the first thing was you spend five years trying to work out how you would create the chips and the hardware and the sensors and the screens and so on in order, in order to be able to do that. Today, you can just go to Shenzhen and say, we'll have a number three and number 15, please, and then it gets put together for you. And so the question is more about the vision and the route to market than the kind of the underlying um, core technology. The first thing, of course, that this does, the next thing it does is it remakes the internet. So this is the annual American spending festival, Black Friday, and you can see that roughly 50% of all e traffic to US e-commerce sites was coming from mobile devices, and perhaps a third of all of the transaction value was coming from mobile devices. So people aren't just surfing, they're buying. 
Now, you would expect, incidentally, to see value being a little bit behind traffic because you can look at these things anywhere. So you can look at a car um, while you're standing in the queue in Starbucks. But the fundamental issue here is that that weight of traffic and consumption, how people look at content and find out about it, has shifted from being a PC story to being a mobile story. It's also, of course, worth thinking that when we say mobile, we don't necessarily mean mobile in a conventional sense. What this chart is showing you is where people use the internet on their smartphone. And you can see pulled out in the right here, the proportion of people who only use mobile, who only use the internet on their phone when they're out of home, when they're standing in the queue at Starbucks or whatever, is actually pretty small. People are using smartphones everywhere all the time. They're using it when there's a PC a foot in front of them, when there's, a, when, there's a PC, a lap, when there's a laptop computer on the table in front of them. They're using the internet everywhere. And so mobile doesn't mean when you're walking down the street or sitting on a train or waiting for a coffee. Mobile means absolutely everywhere that you might be at any time in your day. Whereas PCs, in effect, were geographically limited. The PC was stuck to a certain place, and you could only use the internet where the PC was. And if you weren't where the PC was, you couldn't use the internet. With a smartphone or a tablet, the internet goes everywhere. So it loses that geographic constraint. Moreover, those devices have changed what we mean when we say the internet. So for 20 years, the internet meant a web browser and a mouse and a keyboard. And there were a few things around the side, like email or Spotify or Skype. But fundamentally, most people's internet experience was a web browser and a mouse and a keyboard on a table somewhere. And mobile ended that. Half of all time spent online in the USA is now happening inside smartphone apps. So not half of all time spent on mobile, half of all time spent online is happening inside smartphone apps. So we've moved on from that single unified paradigm of the web browser. As a consequence, we've also moved on from the single unified paradigm of Google, because Google is fundamentally about analyzing links and sending you to web pages. But if the internet is no longer just about web pages, then that page rank model breaks down just as so, and hence so just as we are post Netscape, we are also post page rank. We haven't, however, settled on something new, because all of these interaction models are completely unsettled. If I was to say I installed an app on my Android smartphone in five years' time, I don't really know what any of those words would mean. If I was to send you a coupon for a ride on Lyft inside Facebook Messenger in a year, you might tap on it and get an interface to order a Lyft, and it might pull your payment information out of Facebook and your identity out of Facebook, and you could order the ride right there. And you haven't used the web, but you haven't installed an app either. And so installing an app are terms that are going to change. Um, and everything that Google and Apple and um, indeed Facebook are doing on their platforms is around further blurring those questions of what it means to install something or to use an app or to use a web page, whether that's web apps or notifications or messaging or smartwatches or even things like Google Now. I also don't know what Android is going to mean. It might be that the, the Google story in five years' time is that you use a Chrome phone where Android is a sort of legacy runtime, but most things are happening as web apps. It may be that you're using a device um, with a custom version of Android from some other manufacturer. And of course, you may be doing that on a watch or on Google Glass version 2, if that ever happens, or on a wearable or a tablet or some other device. So again, we've left behind that unitary model, but we haven't settled on something new. We've also left behind um, the unitary model of a single ecosystem, because now there are two. And so there's an old line by Groucho Marx, these are my principles, and if you don't like them, I've got others. Well. <laughs> This is my market share, and if you don't like it, I've got another market share. And so what you see here first is global handset sales, and Apple has about 15% of all the phones sold on Earth, and Android is the next 50 to 60%, and then the rest are feature phones that are converting very fast to those $35 Androids I talked about earlier. But then Apple devices have a majority of all the web browsing happening on mobile devices. And then if you look at Facebook use in New Delhi or in San Francisco, you see a very, very different split. Not altogether surprising, given that Apple only sells phones for $600. And then if you look at App Store revenue, you see that Apple devices contribute about two-thirds of all the revenue, and Android devices one-third. And that's even though there are at least twice as many Android devices in use as there are Apple devices. So the average Apple device generates around four times as much App Store revenue as the average Android device. And so what you see here is that there isn't just one ecosystem. There's not just one market. It used to be that the tech industry was the USA and a bit of Europe and a bit of Japan. And the customers were all basically the same, and the route to market was all basically the same. So the market share was the market share. Well, now there's lots of different market shares, depending on who you are and where you are and what markets you're in and what your customers look like. Um, and we have two perfectly strong, viable ecosystems within that competing with each other but serving different types of customers in different ways. 
Finally, the phones themselves are more sophisticated than PCs. So it's not just the software and where they're used, it's the device themselves. There's an old saying in computer science that a computer should never ask a question it should be able to work out the answer to. Well, what a smartphone does is fundamentally change what the computer can know. Because now it knows where you are, and it knows what photographs you've taken, and who your friends are, and whether you're standing up or walking or sitting down. It knows your payment information. It knows your phone book. And all of those sensors and all of those APIs and capabilities change what a computer can know, change what a service can know about you, change what kind of businesses become possible. When you pull all of this together, you get a multiplier effect. And so there will be two or three times more smartphones than PCs on Earth by 2020. But you have to multiply those smartphones and discount the PCs. You have to discount the PCs because they're either corporate and locked down and you're not allowed to do anything with them, or they're consumer and they're shared and they're mostly at home. When then you have to multiply the, P multiply the smartphones because everyone has one in their pocket. It's one per person, not one per household. And they're much easier to use. They're taken everywhere. They have all these capabilities of payment and sensors and location and everything else. And so you, when you multiply that, you get a much, much bigger increase in opportunity than just the number of devices. It's how they're used and what they can do, not just the fact that everybody will have one. The obvious expression of this is Facebook, which has built a $7.5 billion mobile advertising business from scratch in the last couple of years. I think an even clearer example is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is doing about 20 billion messages a day. And the entire global SMS system of every mobile operator on Earth is doing about 20 billion. So WhatsApp is 50% bigger than SMS with 40 engineers. Now, I think that points to a broader issue, which is a fundamental change in opportunity. In 2000, the archetypal startup might have had 100 staff and a million users, and they might have raised 10 or $20 million. And in fact, if you wanted to do anything, you had to raise 10 or $20 million, because that was what it cost just to get the hardware and the software in place to implement even the most basic kind of service. Today, that same product, that same business, might have 10 staff and 10 million users, and they might have raised a half a million or a million dollars. And you're already starting to see companies where you have one engineer and no money raised, and they've got a million or two million dollars, a million or two million users. The joke in the industry is we're going to see a social messaging app that has 100 million users, and people go, yeah, it's kind of subscale. Let's see when they've got some numbers. And that's really the change. On the one hand, the size of the addressable market has increased by an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude. On the other hand, the cost of going to market, the cost of building those businesses, or at least the cost of getting to the first million or two users, has collapsed by several orders of magnitude. And that really changes the opportunity. So we have these mobile things everywhere. And of course, mobile dominates our attention. This is data from the UK across 24 hours on the time that people spend um, looking at a screen and then wasting it doing anything else, like sleeping or talking to people or something. And you can see media and communications activity here in purple really dominates um, people's day. That means that school glass is eating the world. So this is global sales of LCD screens in billions of square foot. About 5 billion square foot of screen will be sold this year, so roughly one square foot for every adult on Earth. But at the same time, if you ask what those screens are, what are the devices that people are using to watch video today, you see that TVs are, are in a minority. So Eric Schmidt famously said that by the summer of 2000, the majority of t majorities of TVs on sale would have Google TV embedded. He was, of course, completely wrong. But directionally, he was completely right, because actually TVs are now a, major a minority of the devices used to watch video. Um, not the minority of consumption, which is still heavily on TV, but a minority of the devices that people can use. It's now heavily outnumbered by all these other screens. If you then ask children what they would miss most, well, the answer is mobile. Um, you can see an interesting split here in between boys and girls caring about games consoles, but otherwise you can see that the preference for both groups is dominated by mobile and tablet, um, with PCs much smaller, and legacy platforms like books and you know, magazines and things squashed up into the top. This study, incidentally, has a fantastic chart where it shows what parents would like children to spend their time doing, what children would like to spend their time doing, and what parents themselves actually spend their time doing. <laughs> and you can see a kind of a big difference between aspiration and reality in, in, in each of those charts. But if you then ask children how they spend time um, communicating, again, you see a fundamental generational change. Email is for your grandparents. And so on the left here, adults have at least half of their communications activity happening inside email and um, phone calls. Some of that, of course, is entry to the workforce, but a lot of it is just a fundamental change in attitudes, whereas all communications activity for teenagers is now happening inside social networks and messaging apps and photo messaging apps of one kind or another. It's interesting, I think, also to dig into that photo messaging app for a moment. 
In 1999, about 80 billion photographs were taken by consumers. Um, that was the peak of the film camera industry, the analog industry. 2014, at least 800 billion photographs were shared on social networks across Facebook, Snapchat, um, WeChat, and the other major networks. It's quite likely that more photographs will be taken this year than were taken on film ever, ever, because that 800 billion is just the one shared. The number of photos taken is probably 10 times that, could be 100 times that. Nobody really knows. And more iPhone and, and Android, more iPhones and Android phones have been sold than were sold by the camera industry in its entire history. And it's interesting, I think, to look at what that meant for the camera industry. And so here you see the Japanese industry sales since the war, and you can see the film industry growing steadily. And then you see for, the, for a couple of years, it looked like the arrival of digital was this fantastically wonderful thing for the camera industry. Because all of a sudden, you had these really great new devices that were much more convenient, and people were replacing them really frequently because they were getting better all the time. And so sales of um, fixed lens, that's to say point and shoot cameras, surged, and sales of, of SLRs surged. And then smartphones reached a moment where you didn't actually need a point and shoot camera anymore, and sales of those cameras collapsed. And then a year or two later, the same thing started happening to DSLRs. And this is a, something that you have, see quite often as digital impinges upon old-fashioned industries, that it's first of all digital makes the old product better, and then all of a sudden it creates a new product that kills the old product entirely. And so digital looks to begin with like everything's going great, that it's going to be wonderful, we're going to make lots more money than we did before, and then all of a sudden somebody comes along and crushes you. And I think there's a broader story in here about technology outgrowing the technology industry. Tens there tend to be three phases of technology deployment. There are companies that make technology, and that's the companies that you've seen today, that you'll see later on, the companies that we invest in, that everybody in this part of the world builds. Then there are companies that buy technology, and then there are companies that are built around technology. And those sound quite similar, but they're actually fundamentally different things. So companies that buy technology tend to remind me of this image. That is to say, every big company has people whose job it is to water the plants, and fix your chair and adjust the air conditioning and bring your new keyboard and install the new antivirus software onto your PC or update Microsoft Office or something. And you're polite to those people and you have a budget for them, but you don't invite them to strategy meetings and you don't think about them as being part of how your business is going to function. They're just part of the furniture. Technology is part of facilities. It's part of the wallpaper. It's part of the furniture. It's not something that's the future of your business. If you contrast that with companies that were built around and are being built around new technology, I picked a couple of examples from the old world and a couple of examples from the new world. First, both McDonald's and Walmart are companies that are fundamentally enabled by trucking and interstate highways. They wouldn't exist without trucks. And there's other technologies in there as well, like early computers and refrigeration and so on. But fundamentally, they're enabled by trucks and highways. But if you, and Sam Walton knew exactly what he spent on diesel every week. But he wasn't running a trucking company. He was running a retailer. And in the same sense, if you talk to people at McDonald's who've been there for their whole life, they will say, I bleed ketchup. They actually do say that. They say, I bleed ketchup. Um, but they, because they're in the food business. I could say they're in a restaurant business as well, depending on your perspective. But they're certainly in the food business. And in the same sense, Airbnb and Uber and Lyft are fundamentally enabled by smartphones. They're made, they would not be possible without smartphones. They certainly wouldn't be possible without the internet. But they're not in the technology business. They're not selling smartphones. They're not selling a technology experience. Rather, what Airbnb sells you is travel. And what Uber and Lyft sell is a transportation experience. The obvious example of that, the, the, by far the biggest example of this kind of approach, is Amazon, which is a retailer built around technology. And as you can see, this chart shows you their revenue and their net income back since launch. And Amazon's revenue is a straight line up and to the right. And Amazon's net income is a straight line to the right. Um, <laughs> in fact, we've got really big screens here. So you can see that in 2010, they did accidentally make a profit. Um, somebody in the controller's department got fired for that. Because if you were this company, why would you stop and take a profit? After all, Amazon only has about 1.5% of the entire US retail industry by revenue. Um, excluding automotive and gasoline and things like that. So they're about 1.5% of where they want to be. And if you go back and compare them with Walmart, here you see Amazon's revenue since foundation and then Walmart's revenue back since the, um, the mid-'80s. Um, and you can see here exactly what Jeff Bezos is trying to do. He's doing that with software. He's doing that with technology. Increasingly, he's doing that with mobile. But he's going after Walmart. He's not going after IBM. He's trying to build a global retailer. He's not trying to build a global technology company. What we think is that mobile will allow much many more of this, these kinds of companies. That is to say, 10 years ago, Airbnb would have tried to sell software to Hilton. 
and that probably wouldn't really have worked at all. And Uber or Lyft would have tried to sell software to taxi companies, and that probably would have worked, and you could have built a business, but it wouldn't be a very good business, and it certainly wouldn't have changed what it means to own a car. Whereas today, those kinds of businesses are fundamentally changing what um, travel or transport or all of these kinds of industries actually mean. They're transforming those industries using software. And what we think is that the scale of mobile on the one hand and the scale of software on the other mean that this opportunity just becomes much bigger, that far more companies will follow Amazon or follow Uber or Lyft or Airbnb to disrupt other industries with technology. Another way of thinking about this, I think, is that when technology is fully adopted, it tends to disappear. So this chart shows you the frequency of the word railways in Google Books since 1800, which is as, as good a data set as any. And you can see that people start off by talking about railways a lot. And then when railways are everywhere, they stop talking about them. Um, because you don't need to talk about railways, they're just there. Um, the same thing, even more clearly, I think, happened to steel. We're all sitting on steel chairs in a steel building at steel tables. We got here in steel vehicles, but we don't think of ourselves as being in the steel business, because steel is just part of the world that everything else gets built on, much as um, Walmart or McDonald's got built on trucking and don't think of themselves as being in the trucking business. The same thing then happened to computerization. Everything got computerized, and then people forgot about it and stopped thinking about it as a way of building a new kind of company. And the same thing is now happening with software. Software is becoming the way that you create a new kind of company in every single industry, not in the technology industry. What I think that means is that software, as Mark likes to say, is eating the world. But the other manifestation of that is that software is kind of outgrowing the tech, and technology is outgrowing the tech industry, because technology is no longer selling technology as technology to people who are writing a check for it, while the people are using technology to build things that are not in the tech industry at all. Thank you.